Hi, my name is Nina Menkes, and I'm really excited to be presenting Brainwash Sex Camera Power. The film took about two and a half years to make, but the content of the film is something that I've been thinking about and talking about and teaching about for at least 25 years. Even though I have been talking about these things and I understand the male gaze in cinema and I've been bothered by it, it really was through the process of making the film. The actual process of making the film was transformational for me and I started realizing how embedded this stuff is really inside, practically in our DNA structure and we have to get free of it. The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. It's the stuff that I think you thought and maybe I thought, well, everybody knows this, it's in the ether, but it's the ether. And so to name it and to show it is something that I believe can change the world. The first step of freedom is consciousness. So I hope that you'll come with me on this journey of re-envisioning the history of cinema and starting a new era of cinema where women are not primarily the sexualized objects for the use, pleasure, and satisfaction of male viewers. So, to get the ball rolling with discussion about this amazing film, some might think that uh, Laura Mulvey's use of the, the, the male gaze, the idea of the male gaze, uh, conceptualization of the male gaze, which Nina draws a lot on in a film, is obsolete, outdated. Laura Mulvey developed this analysis a while ago. Um, and the assumption is, I think, very often that this is okay. It's been there, done that. It's it, it, we've, we've now moved on. Um, the thinking is that there are many powerful women in film, and media conventions have changed. Yet Nina's recent film draws a lot on Malvi's formulation to demonstrate that things have actually not changed. And if we pay attention, we realize that they haven't. In fact, Jabba was talking about the way in which she was talking to um, other filmmakers. And they were saying they really need to revisit how they have been representing and filming and using certain aesthetic conventions. Um, Nina also draws attention to how highly politicized the visual representation of gender, gendered bodies are. In other words, what seem to be neutral or universal visual aesthetic conventions have very harmful implications. And we see these implications today in the recent anti-abortion sentiment and laws surfacing in the US. This is a major wake up call that we can't afford not to take cultural representations of women's bodies uh, seriously. But I don't want to hog the show. Let's turn to the panelists, starting with Nina as filmmaker. Nina, I mean, this is your form and you've said what a lot of what you want to say about the male gaze, but can you offer some reflections on what the male gaze has meant to you in your work and what it's meant to try and challenge this um, that you haven't raised in your film? And maybe comment on why this film might be particularly prescient um, in the present day, in 2022, um, in view of what's happening in the US, for example. Absolutely. Um First of all, thank you for that um, very uh, brilliant um, introduction uh, and and kind of wrap up of, of some of the key issues. Um, certainly, um, that's an easy way to to try to dismiss um, the issues that say, oh yeah, Laura Mulvey, 1975, you know, old news, whereas um, unfortunately, um, the, you know, the Supreme Court reversal of Roe v. Wade on Friday um, shows us that women are still seen today as objects and not subjects. And this is really one of the key points of the film, which is 
um, this this distinction between subject and object. And I, I do talk about this in the film, but it's worth revisiting it in light of Roe v. Wade and, and, and our real life issues, which is, you know, a, a subject is a full on human being and an object is acted upon by a subject or serves a subject or, you know, pleasures a subject or is there to do the subject's bidding but is not a full on human being. And in fact, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, there's been a video flying around the, the, uh, the internet of her statement from 1993, when she was up for confirmation um, to become a Supreme Court justice. And she, she specifically made this statement, which to me ties directly into brainwashed and the issues that we're looking at. She said, you know, having the concept that a woman cannot make a decision about her own body and her own self shows that you see that woman as less than fully human. Boom. That's the whole point of what we're talking about is that within the visual structure, within the formal structure of the way films have been shot, too many, not all, you know, have there been people who go against? Yes, throughout history there have been and there are now. But the majority of films position the male subject as the subject, as the full on human subject with the woman, the sexualized woman, almost always in the object position. And that subconsciously seeps into our whole feeling, not only men's feeling about women, but our feeling about ourselves. I think we lost our brilliant monitor. There she is. <laughs> Sorry. I took some time out to have a quick cigarette. Um, yeah, no, I think I think your point about um, the way that it, 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 it has to do not only with the way that men see us, but the way that we see ourselves is so crucial to Malvi's formulation and also is so crucial to your film. Um, you know, it's not a matter of, well, and look at us this way, but it's the way in which certain aesthetic discursive conventions have been normalized and have become hegemonic. So we internalize this and dislodging this is so hugely important. And what I understand from your film is that um, you are saying that we really need to pay much more attention to cultural representations. They matter. You know, I think so often, especially in the global South, the assumption is that we need to deal with bread and butter issues, and then we move on to questions of culture and representation. But you are saying that this is where, you know, the area of cultural representation is a site that shapes us. This is where we acquire our sense of self. I wonder if I can't now move on to Sandra as the producer and ask her to say some things about, I mentioned earlier on that I, I had a sense that you were familiar with the belly of the beast, that is the media and film industry. Um, I wonder if you can't say something about your sense of the male gaze and how you have resisted it, um, possibly with reference to Nina's film. Well, thank you. And thank you for having us today and for having this conversation you know, what we're facing really is a global epidemic of rape culture, power, domination, and control by one group over another. And so we're all in this together. And let me just say, you know, I not only work with storytelling, I also work with research to look at the impact of story on audiences. And you know, we, don't, we, we have no idea how much we are affected and shaped by what's on the screen. First of all, we're all on a screen pretty much all day, big screen, small screen, but we're always consuming. So we're always being shown who we are or who we think we should be. And what the research shows, there's, there's a term in the social science research that is transportation. And I talk about this in the film very briefly, but what it means is, you know, if you think about watching your favorite film of all time, you know, maybe you're in a theater in the old days, you know, and you're looking at a big, big screen. 
we lose track of time, we forget our surroundings, we come to identify with the characters, we come to care deeply about them and what happens to them. We end up in a state of suspension of disbelief. In, now that is the key to good storytelling is to transport us to that point of suspension of disbelief. But it's also the time when we don't even realize how much we're learning. It's the point at which we have the highest knowledge gains, the biggest shifts in attitude, and the biggest changes in our behavioral intentions. What I intend to do and how I intend to behave. This is how powerful storytelling is. And it can be a benefit you know, in the, under the best circumstances. And it can also do us in when we're unconscious about what we're absorbing. And so when you have this kind of misogyny surrounding you all the time, it, as you said, Desiree, it's something that we internalize. We start treating ourselves that way. We start treating ourselves as objects. We start treating ourselves as if our success depends on pleasing or pleasuring or complying in some way with you know, the, the dominating group in power. That is a very dangerous concept. <laughs> and unfortunately, it shapes a lot of us. And so you know, I, I just want to kind of leave in, in this space the seriousness of what we put on the screen. And you know, as Nina said, we uphold creative freedom above all. Creative freedom is key. What we're asking is that people be conscious about what they're putting out there. They may choose to tell a story in a certain way. That's okay. What's not okay is just to keep perpetuating these, you know, the power domination and control that characterizes rape culture of men over women, usually it's men over women, that, that unconsciousness is no longer okay. So we're trying to wake up audiences and creators. Um, and, and then to the belly of the beast, as you said, of the industry, you know, I learned to inspire instead of finger wag. So I've worked very closely with a lot of TV shows, the top TV shows over the last 15 years. And I started focusing them around 2016 on rape culture, sexual consent, and human trafficking. And I started, I, I created a series of story tours. In fact, in fact, my very first story tour ever was to South Africa. And after South Africa to India. And the idea was to get people out of their little bubbles and into the real world to meet real people on the ground and hear stories in a real context. And that began to wake up the storytellers. And that's what we're hoping this film will do is wake up the storytellers so that they have choice to tell stories in a different way. And I'll just close with one of the stories that resulted from a rape culture story tour I did, I took groups of writers and producers into rape treatment centers, was an episode of Grey's Anatomy on sexual assault. And the power of that story was that there was a 43% increase in calls to the national rape hotline number after that episode aired, immediately after it aired. Why? Because in that episode, oh, I have goosebumps again, women were given agency during the rape kit collection process. Their agency had been taken away during a sexual assault, but it was given back when the women, the survivor learned that every step of the way, she had the power to say yes or no if she was asked, do I have your permission to take a swab of saliva? Do I have your permission to take a piece of hair? She could say yes or no every step of the way. So I would say agency is one of the things we're after when we think about people as subjects. As women become subjects rather than objects, they have agency to decide and to choose. Thanks so much, Sandra, for that. 
Um, I'm particularly struck by your focus on um, the importance of change in consciousness and the emphasis on agency. Um, but what I'm also thinking is that, I mean, what, something that, that Nina makes very clear in a film is the extent to which very often it's not so much the subject matter, the story that's being told, but it's those subliminal things that go on in the background, how women's bodies are depicted, um, you know, lighting, um, angle, that, that somehow kind of perpetuates an idea that actually these are bodies which, irrespective of what they are saying or what they are doing, are actually not really seriously powerful bodies. And those conventions are so hard to shake. And I'm wondering whether I can't turn to Jabu here, because Jabu is a filmmaker who has really been focusing on trying to break these conventions in all sorts of ways, um, thinking about new ways of representing non-binary bodies, women's bodies. Jabu, your sense of the challenges related to counteracting, challenging the male gaze. Mm. Thank you so much and thank you for having me on this panel. I think what really brought back home for me upon watching this documentary was this idea that there is still so much need for unlearning um, because as audiences, you're not taught to question what you're seeing, you're not taught to question what you're watching, and you're not taught to question why certain decisions have been made. And even as a filmmaker, when you study, you're taught to question, but you're not taught to question that this is from a male perspective or from a male gaze or certain things are um, yeah, framed and interpreted in certain ways. So even for me, as someone who studied and Laura Mulvey's essay was one of the first things that I really learned and that inspired me. I still spent the rest of my year learning Hollywood films and studying Hollywood films that was completely counteractive to what, you know, they were trying to teach regarding Laura Mulvey's essay. Um, and then even learning things recently, like the Bechtel test and seeing how that comes into play within even recent movies. And that, that gap is still so low in that women are still very much the object. And we've become so normalized to just accept it that it's not even coming into our consciousness anymore to question it, it's just accepted. Um, so I think that the challenges is really about, yeah, unlearning certain Hollywood tropes and certain filmmaking tropes that we just take as a given and take for granted and really going back and questioning exactly every choice and decision that we make as filmmakers, um, what that means, what that says, what the intention is. Um, yeah, and I'm still figuring that out myself, I think. Um, watching this movie again, it made me want to go back to older work and relook with fresh eyes, you know, because it's almost like, yeah, when you're young and when you make films, you're not considering these things sometimes. So yeah, I think it's all just about constantly questioning, constantly having those ideas in your head. Um, yeah. Thanks, Jabu. Um, as people were speaking, I was thinking of this idea of post-feminism and this belief that, which of course is totally discredited by, discredited by the Roe versus Wade overturning. Um, the way in which so many people believe that we do really live in an era where women are claiming their own bodies on their own terms always, which is not to deny agency. But, you know, I think that there's a certain over-optimism um, about this idea that women are claiming their agencies and their sexuality and their bodies um, in certain ways, especially on social media. I wonder, uh, Nina, if I can't start with you, could you talk about your sense of the implications of what you are raising for social media and young women today, um, especially in, in, in relation to sexuality? <clears throat> well, you know what, I mean, I um, have a, my perspective as um, a faculty member at CalArts is that I have a lot of contact with very young people <clears throat> through my teaching 
And um, one thing that, you know, does strike me is that in this younger generation, there is a lot more openness to the idea of queerness. There is a lot more openness to, um, you know, the whole concept of a transgender body and, and equal rights. And, and these, these ideas, at least among my students, are much more kind of open and obvious to them than, let's say, you know, 30 years ago um, when I was a student at film school. These things weren't really talked about very much. So I see that, but at the same time, um, you have these same young students seeing brainwashed and being completely blown away and saying, I had no awareness that I had internalized this and I am so angry. And, you know, I think that there's a, there's a process of, it's, it's almost like, you know, at the same time. So like on the one hand, you do have, a, 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 I do think there has been in a way a shift of consciousness, but that shift of consciousness is, is concurrent with, um, it's almost like a trick. I feel like it's a trick. It's like, you know, you can be liberated by being, you know, um, how, how shall I say, like a fat object, you know, or a black woman object right as opposed to the thin white woman object so the the idea that objectification can be you know it's really the idea of changing the shape of the object is not the point the point is not being an object at all and i i think that that is kind of tricky sometimes um, because it's been so internalized. So we see like Victoria's Secret is now putting out ads where they have, you know, women who are bigger, women who are not white and all this stuff. And, and yeah, okay, I get it. You know, that's kind of cool in a way, but it's still positioning these women in the object position. So, you know, it's like, what happens if you're if you actually move from object to subject that's the real impairment and i believe that roe v wade um you know what happened with roe v wade and the uprising of trump and you know it's it's not only in the united states but these right-wing movements um they're very very threatened by the idea that women would become full-on human subjects and they want to push us back into object space and 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 this this you know fear it's almost like in america it's almost like you know there are a lot of people who would rather let go of democracy if they can hold on to male supremacy that's what you know trump I just have to say this because it's so obvious. I mean, everyone knows that Trump was a swinger. He had millions of girlfriends. He probably paid for a hundred abortions himself, right? But what he aligns actually with all these right-wing people in this complete dedication to male supremacy and this, this dedication to having women in the sexualized object position does that make sense? I was just Absolutely. No. Thank you so much also for raising just the extent to which, you know, the, the dominant industry is tied to so many things, uh, political power, um, you know, absolute sense of entitlement among certain groups. And I wonder if I can't shift uh, to Sandra to talk a bit more about that. Again, going to the belly of the beast. What does it mean to actually support projects, films like Nina's um, that go against the grain because I mean the backlash is, is as, as Nina's pointed out, the backlash against women defining themselves as subjects is huge. Um, what does it mean? What have you had to deal with? Thank you for that question, Desiree. As you were asking it, what came to mind immediately is that a woman using her voice is dangerous. That alone is a risk. So every time we speak up, 
Every time we voice an opinion, every time we create something and put it into the world, we're risking. And, you know, to your question about, you know, working on this film, you know, I, I think Nina brought in a group of filmmakers who really care about these issues. You know, some of us have spent our whole lives dedicated to women's rights, reproductive rights, um, you know, creative freedom um, in some way. And, and so when Nina and I had that first lunch at, at Creation Cafe on Montana, I mean, I just remember that moment so well. And she told me about her presentation, the one that she'd been giving at film festivals and that she'd been thinking about making a film about it. And would I join her? I, I just had this inward yes, instantly. There was no doubt in my mind. And when she and I saw it together for the first time on a big screen in Berlin at the Berlin Ollie, it felt so risky to me to be in this in, with this enormous audience, you know, not knowing what the reaction would be. And we actually, like, we, ha we had to sit, you know, a seat apart because of the pandemic. And we reached over and Nina and I actually held hands <laughs> through the screening because yes, it is risky. It is risky to make a film that uh, is in your face and that reveals the truth that people don't want it. A lot of people don't want to know, don't want to see, don't want to hear. And that is just part of, you know, use, that's part of our agency. It's part of using our voice. Yes, are, will there be consequences? Yes, there are always consequences. Is it worth it? Yes, we have to do this. So I would say it has been quite a ride. <laughs> That's all I can say. And we're not done. You know, the film's just getting out into the world. And, you know, Nina's, I don't, I don't know, we, we have to catch up and see where things keep kind of exploding in good ways, um, you know, as the film lands on audiences, but I, I think we're just beginning. And also it isn't just the film, it's all of us together. Because if this begins to wake us up, we need to have strength and we need numbers and we need to work together. What, what occurs to me also is part of that strength and those numbers have to do with um, a, a kind of a, a body of of alternative, particularly young uh, filmmakers who have the energy um, and passion to take this forward. And Jabu, yeah, can I turn to you now? What, what do you make of a conversation that is happening among those who have actually seen feminism move through the 80s um, and in some ways, believe that they are still fighting a battle that was around a long time ago. Just, I'm not sure that's, that's a clear question, but what, 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 what do you see as the challenges that you are confronting today? And do you have a sense of, as a filmmaker, mm. and do you have a sense of this being the continuation of a legacy? Um, do you feel that this is a new, new set of challenges that you are facing now? Mm. I think it, it's so interesting when um, Nina spoke about, you know, representation and this idea that it's not good enough to change what the object is anymore. It's about changing the subject, right? And it's about changing the fact that we don't just want to see Black, queer, trans people of color in front of the camera, but behind the camera telling their stories too, right? Because also for those stories and those real stories to be true and for those people to be subjects it needs to come from a place of honesty authenticity and people who can tell those stories properly and fairly um and i think that yeah besides all the challenges that go into how we show women on screen and how women are still perceived and treated it's also just about who are the people behind those images? Who are the people behind the lens? Who are making those decisions? Who are the execs, the studios, all of those people that are deciding 
that those choices can be made. And those are the types of things that get put out there, right? Because one of the most interesting things from the film that I really like, really had to think about deeply was this idea that, yes, distributors are making those conscious decisions. Like they are choosing what films they wanna see and they could be pushing an agenda that speaks to their own patriarchy or their own um, internalized ideas. So it's also so much just about who are the players within the industry? And that's that's really the biggest challenge. I think, um, yeah, just being a young director and being a young filmmaker, like pushing to really diversify crews can be difficult when you're dealing with other people who are your producers and other people who are deciding where the money gets spent. Um, and it's almost like we have to go back to also then where does that money come from? And as filmmakers making those choices to take money from people that are going to support our vision or take money from people who are going to go against it right um so yeah it's it's so much more interlinked about who's in front who's behind who are all those decision makers behind that that is the real real challenge thank you Jabal. i wonder if we can't return to i think what is really crucial uh, both to Nina's form and to what has been said, the distinction between objectification and subjectification, and something that Shabu raised, which is, you know, we, we might be seeing a kind of a diversity of different bodies, but how these bodies are represented is remains a problem. Um, and it says a lot about the opportunism of the film and media industry. Um, so that's kind of a provocation, and I wonder if I can't just throw that out and ask everybody to comment. Um, Nina, would you like to? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the, um, you know, there has, there has been somewhat of a shift um, kind of in, in TV, we see it more, you know, we're seeing more Black women getting uh, hired to direct um, in TV. Um, we're seeing a, a shift in numbers there a little bit. Um, the, what Jabu brought up about money, it's amazing, however, that the big budget films, you know, the big money films that, and, and, and it's not just the money for the film, it's the advertising budget right so you have you know you have a system i mean i talked about this a little bit in brainwash you know this feeling that like foucault says there's this web there's this uh, there's a web of ideology where the money that funds the films and the money for advertisement and the you know the male gaze perspective male supremacy on planet earth these all reinforce each other and push the other people out so that we are seeing we are seeing a shift i want to acknowledge that we are seeing a shift um but there's almost no shift still in in the big money and the big budgets for advertising i mean imagine if brainwashed had a hundred million dollars in an advertising budget just imagine or hey how about one million dollars for advertising budget right i mean so <clears throat> we are excited that um the american uh, north american rights were bought by kino lorber and we're going to have a theatrical release in the fall now when you when you launch a film um a big part of the film's success is whether the film is good and whether people love it and whether they talk to their friends and say go see this film but another part is advertisement and advertisement takes cash, you know? And if you have a small little tiny advertisement budget, you pray that enough word of mouth will, you know, happen so that, you know, your film will, will you know, stay afloat for a bit. But that, that kind of closed circle with funding and advertisement money and people behind the camera money it's 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 still a very closed circle you know and it's um it's depressing i think it's depressing but it's really uh i don't know it's a process we're in the process i don't know if i lost track of the question here but um i think that it's just an interesting problem that 
high amounts of capital are still flowing to the same kind of films. I mean, you know, Blade Runner 2049 cost $100 million to make, and they probably had a $100 million advertising budget, you know. And I do, I do really think what would happen if Brainwashed had a $100 million advertising budget? I think it could change the world, you know, because the people who do see this film, not every single one, but a lot, are pretty much kind of taken aback and, and have a shift in consciousness. You know, and what if we had that kind of money for for an advertising campaign so that it could really be seen super widely? And it may just sneak out there, you know, word of mouth, like um, things like that can happen. But it's 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 still it's still the same old money game. I, I just you know, it's like, you know. It's, 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 it's just this terrible feeling that, you know, yeah, let's, you know, like you were saying, or we were all saying like, you know, okay, so now we have a, you know, a sexy black woman star. Okay. Yes. Is it progress? Yes, it is in a way. Yes. But you know, when, when are we all going to get to be full on human subjects? I mean, what the hell Supreme Court of the United States? How did, how did Trump even happen? It was really without question, he represented male supremacy and white supremacy. And, and people are so, some people are so scared of that, not being there anymore, you know, that they'll throw everything into the garbage to just keep white supremacy and male supremacy in place. Yeah, just to say that, I mean, your, your sense of the potential power of this film is um, confirmed by the comments in the chat. Very few questions, lots of very long um, discussions of just how much the film meant and how much people have learned. Uh, I wonder if I can't just ask Sandra or Jabu to, if you want to say anything before we turn to the questions, there are a few. Sandra, Jabu. Jabu. Linked to the idea of how bodies are now commodified and it seems to be all hunky-dory and we have mm. these queer bodies in soapies. Mm. And, you know, mm. what are we complaining about? You know, people mm. are represented. But of course, what is the distinction between objectification and subjectification? Yeah, I think like, you know, something that like I think about right now because it is the month of pride is that idea of how also, you know, people and communities and different identities get commodified, right? Because of their representation. So, queer communities get commodified, pride gets commodified, all for capitalization, profit, and those types of things. So it's like representation is only happening when it um, satisfies or um, profit, brings in profit for other people, right? When it, it like um, gives something to them or they get some use out of it. It's not often intentional and true and coming from a place of understanding and really wanting to change up the system. In no way is it that because that requires such radicalization with the way that things work that it would just take, a, like, take away those people's power. Instead, it's how do we use these stories, these people, their community, their ideas, their beliefs and commodify it and take it and kind of entrain, like use it as a way to push our own agenda and our own um, profit and ideas. And even, you know, something like what was interesting within this film is just, you know, like Wonder Woman, right? Okay, here is a woman director, Wonder Woman. It's like this huge film about women empowerment and everything. And then you look at the way that it's shot. You look at the way that she's dressed and you realize it's all for their marketing and profiting um, ideas. So they're pushing this idea that it's this feminist film, but yet all the subliminal messaging, all the framing and everything intentionally is still pushing patriarchy and the ideas of patriarchy. So it's such a, it's, it's so dangerous because it makes it even harder to 
question and reflect and truly see what are the intentions and the reasonings behind certain companies showing black, brown, queer bodies behind um, filmmakers, women filmmakers getting money to make certain films because you're like, you're, yeah, you're being disillusioned by what they're telling you rather than what they're actually doing and what they're actually showing. Thanks, Jabu. Um, I think we have a few questions now. There's a question from Taryn, um, which, uh, yeah, the, the question is, could you discuss the use of 145 film clips? Um, Nina, this is for you. Uh, how did you, why did you choose them? How did you choose them? How, what were the practical implications of that in terms of copyright, I suppose, and licensing? Right. Well, it's actually 175. Or it's actually, if you count every little clip, it's more closer to 200 film clips. Um, the process of choosing the clips um, was hard because even though we included like 200 film clips, there was like 400 more film clips that we could have included. Like people were like, well, what about Sergio Leone and the, and the Westerns, you know? And yeah, we had Sergio Leone in there and then we took it out, you know, because at a certain point you just have to say, okay, let's, uh, this seems like the best example right now, you know? Um, and what we always had to consider was the historical arc. So for example, there's that sequence where we're talking about, um, you know, framing and this, this shot that we've all seen a million times of, you know, more or less a, you know, a woman who's bending over and we see her butt, right? So the, the first, um, the first example we have of that one is from an Adam Sandler film. Uh, grown ups, I think it was, or growing up or something. And so you see that, you know, you see the woman bending over and it's her butt and you see men looking at her butt. Right. And so you're, so then everyone's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. B movie. We know B movies are like that. Then we hit them with rear window by Hitchcock. Oh, whoops. Hitchcock did it in one of our favorite films. Oh, whoops. And that's from, you know, a long time ago, right? Classic film. And they're like, oh, yeah, but that's a long time ago. And then we hit him with Quentin Tarantino, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood from 2019. Same shot, close up on a woman's butt. So that was a consideration, you know, how do we show the clips over time? And how do we show the A-list films? all the directors that everyone reveres, right? You know, Quentin Tarantino and Martin Scorsese and Sofia Coppola, these are the, you know, the gods of cinema. So it's not just the B movies, it's not just music videos. Everyone knows music videos are all about TNA. No, it's the A-list. So that was the selection process. Um, and then the, um, <laughs> I see someone, someone's asking about objectifying white males. No, we're not objectifying white males. We're pointing out a power dynamic. Um, so anyway, um, just a quick word about uh, the, the licensing. The licensing of the film clips, if we had to pay for each film clip, would have, would have been millions and millions of dollars. Um, but the film clips came to us under uh, the fair use doctrine in the United States. We had to work very closely with an attorney who reviewed literally every single film clip more than once. I think our attorney's seen the film more than anyone, <laughs> almost more than me, or at least uh, getting up there. Every film clip had to be reviewed. And sometimes he would say, well, this film clip, I, I see your point, but you know, it's not quite a hundred percent a perfect example, you know. So it has to meet the um, the guidelines for fair use. Are you know that the clips have to be um, cultural critique, educational, and historical perspective, recontextualizing film clips in a new way. So I'm not just showing you, you know, the sequence from Raging Bull in the same way that it was in the film. I'm showing you the sequence from Raging Bull and then I'm asking you to look at it in a new way. 
So then that comes under fair use and fair use um, means that we're allowed to use the clips um, without paying a licensing fee. Yeah, this was not central to your response, but maybe I could invite, I think it was Bob Smithers to, to take very seriously that uh, phrase that Nina used, which is to see things in a new way. It's not simply a matter of who is being looked at, but what the political implications are of being positioned in a certain way, which has, which has implications for how the looker and those who are looked at are defined as human beings or not human beings. So, yeah, there was another question, um, which is, uh, what advice would you give to male filmmakers? And I think this is a question for all three uh, panelists, to male filmmakers exploring sexuality through female characters. Yeah, anyone want to take that? Maybe not Nina, I don't know, Nina, you might, you might be tired of that kind of question. I'm just going to um, thank you all. I'm sorry, I have to jump off right now because I have another panel in two minutes. So okay. thank you. And this has been amazing. And Jabu, we're gonna be staying attuned to you and your work and keep going. <laughs> thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Sandra. Yeah, but do, you, do you want to respond to that? We need, we need to close in four minutes, so. I, I think, yeah, this is, this is quite a difficult question because, I mean, I guess the first question I would have is, you know, what is the reasoning behind wanting to explore sexuality through female characters and point of views as a male? Um, what is your reasoning and your intention behind this? Um, is this something that, you know, you need to explore? Is it something, I guess it's all about the context behind it, but I think, you know, yeah, right now, you know, yeah, right now women need to be having the agency of exploring these things and creating new ways of storytelling and creating new ways of using film to, you know, reframe these things because, Unfortunately, we've been taught such a specific way of filmmaking that is entrenching these ideas. It's almost like there's been a cinematic language created to push these agendas and push um, objectification of women. It's like now a part of film language. So how do we then create new ways of shooting, new ways of filming, new cinematic tools to tell audience certain things and convey certain messages to audiences? And as a male, if you are wanting to do that and really wanting to do that in a way that is, um, yeah, I guess it, it would be so difficult because you're not obviously coming from experience of being a woman and seeing those images and living that experience. So I don't know, I think maybe have a lot of women on your team and a lot of women consulting you and helping you and telling you their perspective, um, yeah. <laughs> I would I would jump in and um, say I think it's a bad idea just drop it right <laughs> like a hot potato and instead of trying to represent somebody else's point of view that you don't know anything about um, why not think deeply about your own point of view because one of the things about the so-called male gaze which is so interesting and so depressing is that it's monolithic so that that's the point of brainwashed you know some people said well you took the you took the shots out of context yes i did i absolutely on purpose took the shots out of context to show you that whether it's comedy or drama or 1920 or 2020 or whatever you get the same kind of shot design and the message in this shot design is this is how you look at female bodies and this is how you objectify women. And this is how women are not subjects, okay? So this monolithic thing is the problem. I don't believe that every man on planet Earth looks at women in this one specific way. What if you fall in love with a woman and the thing that just makes your heart beat is actually, you know, she has this funny little dimple on her cheek or she's 
just a way of the way she talks or the way she touches her ear. I don't know. Does it really have to always be close up on a behind and close up on a boob? Is that the only way that you see things? You know, what happens if you claim your individual, this was what I was trying to say in, in Brainwash. What if you start with, what do I really feel? Not what I've been taught to feel, but what do I really feel? And, and take that thing that I really feel and translate that into a shot. Thank you, Nina. And I think, I mean, what you say in your form, and I think this is why people are so kind of affirming of, of, of how important it was. Um, when one now looks at foam um, or kind of various images and realizes just what's going on, I mean, the sort of, you know, the, the, the segmenting of women's bodies, the particular focus on, on women's naked bodies, it happens all the time, even in films that seem to be uh, progressive and alternative. But I think the encounters people are getting angry now because we are overstaying uh, the time. I think there were questions about the availability of the form, which I think you can easily find out by contacting encounters. So can I hand over to Taryn or do we just say goodbye, Taryn? on Instagram. So. Do you want to let people know how to how to if they go if you go to brainwashedmovie.com, that's our, our website, you can sign up, um, put yourself on our mailing list and we'll let you know about the release of the film. It hasn't been released yet, but it's coming soon and it is being sold um, around the world. Um, and we are also on Instagram at Brainwash Movie, and um, I'm on Instagram at, at Mencus Film. So I'd um, love to hear from everybody. Thank you so much, Thank you Nina. So much. Yeah.